Today, uh, it is my great honor to introduce Professor Shin Ryu from Okinawa Institute of Technology. He's, he was, he's originally from Fuda University, Shanghai, and uh, take a PhD in, in, at the University of Tokyo uh, at the 2011. It's uh, right after the uh, uh, big earthquake, actually. And then he got a postdoc position in the University of Pittsburgh, uh, and his mentor at, at that time is uh, uh, Manfredi. And he worked there for several years, and then he moved to Fukuoka University as an associate professor and uh, assistant professor and also associate professor and worked uh, many, many years. And uh, this April, he moved to Okinawa Institute of Technology. His, uh, his major field is uh, uh, in some viscosity solution, but uh, his major contribution is a prop uh, fine property of uh, uh, property of solutions, especially profiles of solution of uh, degenerate parabolic equations, including level set equation, mean curvature flow equation. And uh, he, he, but besides that, he worked many things, including fundamental theory of of viscosity solution in the metric space and many, many other things. And so I think today he only chose one of his topic. And today he's going to talk about quasi convexity preserving property for fully nonlinear, non local parabolic equations. Please, Professor, thank you. you, please. Thank you, Professor Giga. And I'd like to thank all of the organizers for giving me the chance to talk over here. It is really a big honor for me to. to, to uh, give a talk in this uh, great seminar. So um, today I'm going to talk about this um, um, fully nonlinear, non-local parabolic equations um, with emphasis on this uh, quasi-convexity preserving property. Um, so my, um, I will show you a very general um, class of uh, nonlinear, non-local equations. But um, later I will, I will give you a, a very um, um, simple, I would say, simple and uh, easier to understand. Uh, example. Um, this is a, a joint work uh, with uh, Takashi Kagaya from uh, Murara Institute of Technology and Hiroya Shimitake from University of Tokyo. So as I said, I'd like to first show you a typical problem uh, we are interested in. So this is a, a basically a, a variant of mean curvature flow. So this equation uh, gives the information that the left-hand side is the normal velocity of of uh, a surface, and the right hand side is um, a um, the term. This h re uh, represents the curvature, mean curvature, at each point on its surface. And there's actually a, a non-local term after this curvature term. This is um, the measure of the region enclosed by this closed surface. So um, without this term, it's just a mean curvature flow equation, and we know this very well. And with this term, now we have this uh, driving force, non-local driving force, and it becomes non-local. It means that uh, the normal velocity does not depend only on this uh, local information at its point, but also on the entire, you know, this uh, um, this region information. So, um, well, if we, um, oh, I'd like to mention that the here, this negative sign, this minus sign is important. So it tells us that the, uh, um, Besides this uh, shrinking effect due to the curvature, uh, we also have a expanding effect, basically, um, depending on this uh, the size of this uh, region. So the larger the region is, this expanding effect is stronger. So this is you know, about the sign. If it's plus, then it's different. It tells you that the bigger the set is, the you know the shrinking effect is stronger. But here it's minus, so. So expanding effect. All right, so uh, uh, we want to use this level set method to consider this problem you know, in, by using PDE. So we um, take a function f, uh, depends on x and t, um, whose level set, sub-level set, um, actually equals to such an omega t. And then you can easily see that, uh, well, if you write down the equation, you get this one. And this is, uh, this level set formulation. Um, this ut over the length of gradient u is the normal velocity 
And it's a divergent term, it's nothing else but just a mean curvature at this point. And this is the term M, so the non-local term over here, okay? All right, so um, this is a um, still a geometric uh, problem. Um, well, actually you can consider uh, even more general geometric equations. I mean, this form, I mean, obviously this is a very general form. Um, here by geometric, geometric, I mean, so if U is a solution, so you can take a constant function with an increasing function G, and then this constant function is still uh, a solution of this. This basically means that the, uh, the, the evolution basically is only about the level sets. It, it has to do with you know, the, the value of the function. So all level sets move independently to each other. So only the level sets matter. Okay, I will give you another definition of this uh, you know, being geometric. Okay, so this is a, a general form. Of course, we can consider this too. And this, the mean curvature flow with the local term is just an example. Um, well, this problem is not new. So we uh, can find uh, po well posedness results in these references. Um, so this is Chen Hill's the Logak. They consider this Adam Kahn approximation of this um, non local problem, but in different form, not level set formulation, but in different form. And for the level set problem, um, we can uh, find uniqueness, existing results of viscosity solution um, in these two papers. Uh, Kadalia get, get this, uh, I would say the first result in viscosity solution um, um, in a whole space actually, a Potokoshi problem. And Slepchev, he um, uh, discussed the uh, Neumann problem. Okay. All right. so. Um, this is uh, uh, the problem uh, I would like to talk about today. Uh, so let me uh, also briefly introduce the application of this type of problem. Uh, the first one is from image processing. So, um, well, this is actually a, a paper uh, from the field of image processing. What they want to do is they want to basically think a shape. So suppose this picture is given at the beginning. So you want to use some flow. Well, actually the flow, the flow is actually not the, the equation I just talked about in the previous slide, but something more you know, complicated. So if I have a picture like this, basically it's like a you know, uh, Chinese or Japanese calligraphy, um, you, know, you, you write a, a character by brush and then you want to sh you know, shrink this stroke, make it thinner so that it looks like a character written by a, a pencil or a pen, right? So, well, there are several ways to do this. Um, one method is to use um, one, you know, such type of non-local curvature flow equation. And um, so the equation is more complicated. I will not give you here, but the idea is that uh, instead of, you know, just to um, shrink this uh, shape, you would like to stop some time at some moment, you want to stop it, stop it to use the curvature flow, uh, and you have to detect how thick this, um, this character is, right? So you have to um, somehow include some term which can tell you when to stop shrinking. And this term is actually non-local. So you have to, it's not just about the curvature, but about you know, how, how large this width is. So there's some kind of a term uh, which should be included in this flow. And that's why we uh, think it, uh, you know, considering this non-local uh, curvature flow is important. Okay, so uh, another uh, application is more classical. So this is uh, uh, this kind of equation is used in plasma physics, and I actually you can find you know how uh, this equation is set up you know in these references. Um, the basic form is like this. So it's not curvature flow, but it's a elliptic problem with Laplacian and non-local term. Okay. Uh, I'd like to mention that recently there is, you know, a result by Caffarelli and Tomasetti working on the regularity of viscosity solutions to this type of Boolean and linear non-local equations. Okay, so these are uh, uh, two uh, examples of applications. I mean, I, I think there are many more, but just to give you these two. Uh, so now uh, let me tell you what uh, we 
want to do about these questions. So uh, we are actually interested in a lot of things. Uh, for parabolic questions, we're interested in asymptotic behavior, you know, singularity formation, and also control game interpretation for this uh, non-local problem. Um, but today I'd like to focus on this convexity preserving property. So basically it says that the initially, if initially um, the region enclosed by the surface is omega, omega zero, right? It's convex. Then we want to show that for any time after that, the shape is still convex. The evolution doesn't change the convexity of the region enclosed by the surface. And in terms of the level set method, you can rephrase this property in this way. Um, so if u, the initial value is convex, I mean the level set, any level set, sub-level set is convex, then the solution has the same property. So all of the sub-level set of this, of this uh, solution u are convex for any time, okay? All right, so um, the, the above one is more like a geometric property, right? This is about set. So actually we already know the answer and Catalia get actually proved this for geometric flows. But the, the one below here is about function u, right? So you don't have to, you don't have to consider um, geometric uh, flow. You can actually consider uh, more general PDEs. So this is actually what we call the quasi-convexity preserving property. Um, okay, so here I have to you know, explain it a bit about the quasi-convexity, right? I know this quasi-convexity is used. Uh, it has more, many meanings, okay? But here, uh, by quasi-convexity, I mean the sub-level sets are convex. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the, the meaning of quasi-convexity in this talk. All right, so let me give the definition. Okay, so we say f, a continuous function, is quasi-convex if all of the sub-level sets are convex. Uh, um, okay, so here, this is a strict inequality. It doesn't matter if you want to change it to a, a weaker inequality. Still, it's sub-level set convex. And or you know equivalently you can write your definition this way, so this uh, convex combination of any two points x y has value of f less than or equal to the maximum between the value at the endpoints. Okay, so this is uh, another way to write down the definition of quasi convexity. Okay. Okay, so uh, so this is our work is about convexity preserving property. Actually, this is also a classical you know, topic um, for only like a convexity preserving, not quasi-convexity. Convexity preserving property, you can find you know, many results uh, in, in, in the literature. I just uh, list uh, several. Uh, this, the first three about classical solutions and the paper by uh, Giga Goto Ishisato, which is about viscosity solution for curvature flow, and also Avaris Lazo Leons, also about viscosity solutions. And for quasi convexity, what I, uh, I think it's just, uh, it's, there are fewer results. Uh, what I know is this paper, Kogi and Salani, uh, who uh, talk about um, this uh, quasi convexity of elliptic equations. Okay, so um, our result is going to be a, a basically um, a counterpart for, uh, for par parabolic equations okay, with non-local terms. All right, so uh, let me give you a, a more precise description of our objectives. So this is the equation we are going to consider. So it's uh, very general. I mean, this is f. This f is basically um, um, uh, fully nonlinear elliptic operator. Um, I will give you uh, more assumptions about this F. Actually, there, there's a lot, okay? There is a list of assumptions on this F. Um, here, uh, I'd like to um, mention this set K, okay? So this K is a compact set in Rn, and uh, we have to put this K uh, as an intersection with this non-local term, this sublevel set. Uh, of course, we originally planned to do a general problem without this K, I mean, just the, the sublevel set, but uh, we found it very difficult to prove um, comparison principle, which we will use later uh, if we don't 
you know, put this K set here. So we still don't know if we can, you know, relax this, um, you know, this condition. So if we don't have this intersection with K, actually uh, we found it difficult to prove comparison principle and we don't know if we, how we can fix it, okay? So we will put this K, the compact set with this, um, the intersection with this U sublevel set, okay? All right, so, um, Okay, so what we want to prove is the quasi-convexity results for this type of equations. And we allow you know, more general equations that are probably not geometric. Basically, we don't assume. So this is the condition for a geometric equation. So if it's geometric, then this should hold, but we do not assume this condition, okay? So uh, this R1 and R2 are two different numbers. And here, if it's geomet ge geometric, it basically means that this F does not depend on uh, uh, this R, this unknown function. But we don't, you know, we do want this F to be depending on this R. So we have to, you know, relax the geometricity and we do not assume this. And we also allow this, uh, um, um, this uh, singularity, like usual, you know, mean curvature flow. So this, uh, we, um, uh, P, when P is equal to zero, when the gradient is equal to zero, the problem, the equation can be singular, okay? All right, so, um, uh, we are, uh, so when, um, the another thing we want to, uh, to do is to give a direct PDE proof, okay? So um, as I said, um, this Cardalia get paper, uh, he already proved this result for uh, geometric equations, but using set theoretic arguments. So basically he just talked about how the set is involved, but we want to um, use a PDE proof, you know, without using sets, but using PDE, you know, the function U directly. So this is, a, uh, so the proof would be a little bit different. And also, uh, I mean, we want to somehow, um, understand more about local problem. So uh, since our equation is very general, so we actually don't have to include this non-local term in this, in this operator. So we can reduce the problem to local problem. And we hope to understand um, more about this um, um, uh, uh, quasi-convexity property for local equation. Uh, I want to point out that uh, for local equation, like heat equation, the most important equation, right? it does not preserve quasi-convexity in general. So this actually uh, is proved by uh, Ishige and Salani. They construct a contact example. So we cannot uh, expect this quasi-convexity preserving property even for heat equation. So we want to figure out what happens, okay? So this is uh, another reason why we uh, start this project. Okay, so um, let me... Um, move on to the next slide. And I would like to also mention some uh, related notion uh, to this quasi-convexity. So uh, a more general notion about um, nonlinear convexity, I would say, is this um, power convexity. So uh, you take two positive numbers, A and B, and also take a Q, which is an exponent, and you take lambda between zero and one. You can define this Q mean okay, of A and B in this way, okay? When, when Q is equal to one, it's just the mean, the usual mean. Um, so um, with this mean, you can define Q convex for a positive function, okay? So it is nothing else but just, you know, F at this uh, convex combination, uh, less than or equal to the Q mean of the values of F of X and F of Y, right? So it's just a Q. And, this um, Q convex uh, has, you know, they have a, a relation between each other. Uh, it turns out that uh, if you, this is just Jensen's inequality. So if Q is larger, then this Q convex is weaker. Okay, the larger, the weaker. Okay, and a quasi convexity, at least formally, is the case when Q equal, equals infinity. So you send Q to infinity, you will get quasi convexity. Okay. Uh, or you can also can call it infinite convexity. Um, so this means that this quasi-convexity is the weakest among all of these Q 
complexity. Okay. Okay. Um, so since we only talk about classic complexity, you may wonder what happens if we do Q complexity for finite Q. Well, it turns out that uh, any Q complexity is not preserved. You know, any for any you know finite Q. So uh, a very simple uh, example is this. So you take this equation. Okay, take this equation. This this basically means that the, the normal velocity equal to uh, the measure of the region enclosed by the surface. And I mean, do I, I just do this in R two? So it's just a, a curve and enclosing a, a surf a region, and the normal velocity is exactly equal to the area of the region enclosed by the curve. And actually, you can um, solve this um, equation explicitly uh, with this initial value. Well, this function is convex. This is the, the, the length of x plus one. And you solve it, you get this, uh, this the solution. So believe me, it is the solution. And you can see it's not convex in x. Uh, a picture is like this. So if you look uh, the cross section of this, uh, this solution, you get this picture. It's not convex. It's not convex for t positive. Okay. When t is zero, it's convex. But when t is positive, it's not. Um, so it tells us that the convexity breaks right during the evolution. Um, well, since this equation is geometric, so u to the power one over q is also a solution. So I told you this: if you do composition, right, you composite u with a, 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 an increasing function, it's still a solution. So u to the power one over q is also a solution, and this tells you that uh, the q convexity is also breaking down during the evolution. So if you take the q power of this one, you get u, you that, you get that, right? So so this Q convexity doesn't work in this problem. So the best we can expect is the quasi convexity. Okay, I mean, this is a radially symmetric problem, I mean, equation, uh, sorry, the solution. So of course the level sets are all circles. So the quasi convexity is fine, but not for other you know, power convexity, okay? And another thing is that here you see uh, without this K, um, I mean, the given um, compact set intersect with intersecting with this sublevel set, uh, we cannot expect coercivity uh, of solution. I mean, uh, by coercivity, I mean the, the solution goes to infinity, the value goes to infinity as x, uh, the this, this space variable goes to infinity. Uh, originally, I mean, initially, this is coercive function, but as time goes, you don't have coercivity anymore. So without this k set, we don't expect the coercivity preserving as well. So actually we will use coercivity when we uh, prove quasi complexity because uh, I will explain this later, but basically we want to take some envelope, convex envelope of, of, uh, of solution. Uh, without coercivity, it's, uh, I mean, we can still do that, but we cannot uh, guarantee that the convex, this convex envelope is attained at the point. So co coercive is also a very important property we will use later. So that's why we also would like to put this K set, you know, in this uh, non-local term. All right, so uh, this is a, a very simple example. Now let's uh, uh, look at these uh, uh, assumptions of, of F. Uh, this is a very long uh, list of assumptions. I will explain the assumptions one by one. So uh, Sn is just a, a set of or n by n symmetric matrices, and Bk is the collection of or measurable subsets of k. So uh, the first one is like a very uh, you know usual one. So this uh, tells us that the f is elliptic operator. Okay, and also we have some monotonicity on this unknown function. So on unknown, it's also monotone increasing. And uh, the second one is uh, basically telling that. Uh, um, the, the speed of the solution, in, in, I mean, the, in time, right? So it's it's basically bounded. So we need some boundedness of this uh, operator, okay? But for uh, P bounded and X hashing bound, okay? Uh, okay, so this is uh, uh, F2. And F3 is about the continuity of this operator in a set argument, okay? So the topology we use here is the, uh, the measure of the symmetric difference between two sets. Okay, so this is uh, uh, 
continuity. Actually, we need some uniform continuity uh, uh, with respect to um, all of the Hessian and also bounded uh, gradient and all of the, the, the unknown. Okay, so um, the next one, this one is a uh, monotonicity of the, I mean, the non-local term. So this is uh, uh, kind of uh, important uh, because um, without this um, assumption, uh, usually we cannot expect the comparison principle hold. So um, here it says that the um, bigger set has a bigger uh, value of this F. Okay, so this is a monotonicity uh, of this. So we call this type of problem uh, local, uh, sorry, uh, monotone non-local evolution equations. But if we don't have this uh, property, then it becomes non-monotone uh, problem. That would be harder. Okay. All right, uh, this is F5. It's uh, some uh, regularity. It's like a structure assumption in order for us to obtain the comparison principle. It's also um, quite a standard assumption for uh, people who work on um, viscosity solution uh, if they want you know, to get the comparison principle. Um, of course, here we need to include this non-local term as well, but basically it's, uh, it looks like the same as the usual you know, structure assumption for comparison principle. And the last one, uh, this is about this similarity of the equation. So we allow uh, our equation to be singular, but not that much. So it uh, means that they still uh, wire, uh, sorry, mild singular. Um, so when we take um, this P and X, the head hashing and gradient to zero, this operator convert uniformly to a continuous function uh, in R. And this limit, will not depend on the non-local term. Okay, so only um, a lo local function will pop up. Okay. All right, so uh, these are the assumptions on, on F. And under these assumptions, uh, we can get uh, comparison principle. Uh, before that, I'd like to briefly go over what uh, viscosity solution is. Um, so I, here you see this is the equation, and I need to uh, take this uh, lower and upper semi-continuous envelope of F. And then um, to um, define sub-solution, you test the solution U from above by a C2 function. Okay, so you touch it from above and you get uh, a point, the maximum point is zero T zero, and you use the derivative of the test function, which is C2, um, to, to, to write down the equation, but with inequality, right? This is a sub-solution. Um, here, I would like to uh, uh, emphasize that uh, when we define sub-solution, we take this uh, lower semi-continued envelope of this F. Um, we also um, put a strict inequality in this sub-level set. And you can compare this with super-solutions. Um, for super-solutions, then it becomes minimum because it tests from below. And then you take um, upper semi continuous envelope for the F operator, and you also need to include this equality and this non local set, um, non local term. Okay. Um, the reason why we have this difference here is that, uh, well, you have to um, 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 pay attention to this, uh, um, I would say, discontinuity of this operator in, in U, in the value of U here. Okay. Not only you know, in here, this is also this is also a U term in the operator, but also there's a U term here. So actually, um, the level set is not continuous with respect to the value of U, right? Because you, you can you can move from U a point to the other point with U just you know a little bit you know increasing, but the level set can increase can expand you know in a very large way. So it's it is it, it's not continuously depending on the value of U. That's why we have to, you know, basically take the upper semiconductor envelope also for this uh, U term here. So that's why we have this extra equality uh, in this uh, non-local term. Okay, so um, to define solution, we just combine the definition of sub-solution and super-solution. Okay. All right, so uh, this is the um, comparison principle. So assuming uh, F1 and F F1 through F6, and um, we take one sub-solution, super-solution, and uh, we also need some growth condition 
on this U and V, I mean, they are just linearly uh, growing at space infinity at most. Okay. And also we need some uh, modulus of continuity, right? So basically U and V. They, uh, so basically we prove some uniqueness for um, um, uh, in, uh, this uh, uniformly continuous initial value. Okay, so this is uh, uh, some extra assumption on the initial value. Uh, okay, so then we get uh, U less than or equal to V holes in whole, in whole domain. Okay, this is uh, a comparison principle. All right, so uh, so uh, let me uh, explain some uh, known results about the comparison principle. Uh, so usually um, these re these results are for comparison principle. Comparison principle is known only for either bounded domain or for bounded sub or super solutions. Okay, but ours here is um, for you know unbounded domain. And unbound the solutions here, so it's uh, it's the setting is different, and also uh, I'd like to uh, mention that basically our proof uh, is it just basically follows the the local version of such kind of equation, um, which is uh, given in the paper by Giga Godo Ishii and Sato. Okay, we just rewrite their proof, uh, taking this uh, non-local term into account, okay. and also. Uh, I like to mention this uh, uniqueness for a non monotone equation. I told you that the non monotone problem could be harder. In general, you cannot expect comparison principle, so you have to use some other methods, you know, like a fixed point theorem or something like that. And uh, these are done in these papers. Okay. All right, so uh, this is the comparison principle. Now, let, I'd like to uh, introduce our main result. Uh, about convexity, quasi-convexity preserving. Um, to do that, I need to uh, include one more assumption, uh, key assumption. So there is a, one more assumption on the operator f. Uh, so what is, uh, I'd like to, you know, explain what the, uh, the assumption looked like. So I'd like to first uh, use this um, um, q convexity. Okay, so here I take uh, u to the power of q. Okay, so I write V uh, to be the U to the power of Q. And I um, somehow want to um, um, basically um, approximate um, this quasi-convexity by Q-convexity. Well, this is actually the idea of the proof. So um, instead of studying this uh, quasi-convexity directly, uh, we basically use um, Q-convexity, but let Q goes to infinity. So we want to write down this equation for the U to the power of Q. Okay, and then we get this one, which is very likely. Um, then I um, rewrite it. I introduce a new operator, basically this operator, and I call this G um, beta. Okay, so G beta is this one. So it's like a transformation of the uh, original operator F. Okay, and this beta is equal to one uh, minus one over Q. So we uh, choose a different parameter here. Instead of Q, we use beta. Okay, so then I um, want to send Q to infinity, which means that I would like to send beta to one. And I require this um, uh, offer the G beta to be um, concave and jointly in, in the unknown R and the hash X okay. for beta very close to one. Less than one, but very close to one. Okay. Um, but this is for the case when p is not zero. Okay, when p is zero, so when if p goes to zero, if it's a singular, then we require um, this limit mu function um, to be concave in the sense of this. Okay, so uh, again, the transformed operator right, to be concave in, in R. Okay, so um, this is a, a, a con um, the concavity assumption uh, on F. So you need some kind of such kind of concavity assumption to guarantee uh, the quasi convexity preserving property, in addition to the previous assumptions on F. All right, so um, this is the main result. So now we have this uh, assumption F1 to F7, okay, and U0 is uniformly continuous because our comparison only works for uniformly continuous initial value. 
Um, and U is a unique viscosity solution, actually the unique viscosity solution to this problem. And U is satisfied. Okay, so because we somehow use this Q convexity, so we use the Q mean here. So we want to make sure that our solution is positive. So we only consider positive solutions here. And we also assume this U is coercive. So when X, okay, when X goes to infinity, space infinity, and the value also goes to infinity, okay? For, you know, any um, time between uh, zero to a fixed time T, okay? And U zero, the initial value is quasi-convex. And then we can get U to be um, quasi-convex for all time, all particle time later. Okay, so this is uh, the main result. All right, so uh, uh, you may wonder if such kind of solution does exist or not. So, uh, well, you don't have to worry about the existence of solution because you can use parents method to, to, to get the existence of solutions. Um, well, I mean, for this kind of solution, you have to add more assumption on the initial value. So suppose you have a function below your initial value u zero, which is positive, coercive in space, and then, I mean, if I find a substitution, then you can get a solution which also satisfy all of these assumptions. Okay. All right, so uh, this is the uh, main result. Um, I would like to just mention several um, steps of this uh, proof. I will not give details, but just give you the, uh, just a overview of the, of the proof. So, um, so basically what we want to do is we take um, this quasi convex envelope in space of solution U. And we want to show that this envelope is a super solution. Okay, then by comparison principle, we know that uh, this would be bigger than or equal to U. Okay, and on the other hand, by definition, U star is less than or equal to U. So then we have to, we have we get U star equal to U, which means that the U itself is quasi convex. And to do this, as I said, we basically approximate this uh, convex, quasi-convex envelope by Q convex envelope. So instead of put this U star, we take U Q. Here on the right-hand side, we replace this uh, uh, maximum by the Q mean. Okay, then we still can get a, 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 an envelope. And um, since we also have this um, um, coercivity, so this minimum can be attained at, far, at some y and z, okay? And now we can get some information for this u to the power q um, at the point y and z, okay? At a minimizer. And these are the inequalities. I mean, because v uh, is a super solution of this, we can write down this. Okay, and um, we also do the same thing. We take the q's power of u q, and now we can rewrite this relation. This is a minimum re minimality relation. Then we can rewrite it and we see that, the, okay, so VQ and V has uh, this uh, minimality relation. So VQ minus this convex combination attains a minimum. And by using this uh, minimality, we can get some information about the derivative. So this is only formal. I mean, for the rigorous proof, you need to use the you know, definition of viscosity, so you have to use the test functions. But here, formally, you can get relationship between um, the first derivatives, the time derivative, you know, first derivative space between VQ and V, and also second derivatives. Well, this is just calculus, right? Mm -hmm. And also you, what you want to do is you just want to plug in all of this information, you know, uh, in these two inequalities. So you want to just uh, take the complex combination of these two inequalities using all of this information here, and you will get uh, any, any inequality for BQ at the end. And you send Q to infinity. Well, that's the strategy. Okay, so uh, of course you have to also, you know, uh, take this uh, non-local term into account because it's there. So you also need to uh, make sure that the, this non-local term does not, you know, um, make much difference in this argument. So you have to also show that the, um, uh, it's not that different if you replace this, uh, the little non local term for you um, by the non local term uh, about u star. And 
Actually, it is not that different. You can send Q to infinity and the difference is very small, it's still zero. So we can easily replace that with some error at the end. And, uh, and then the other things are just what I've described. So you, um, you combine this inequality and use the relationship we just uh, you know, go went over in the previous slide and you will um, get an inequality um, for BQ. Um, here we use the concavity because concavity of G beta, because you want to basically, you know, multiply the first inequality by lambda, multiply the second inequality by one minus lambda and add them up. And then you here to deal with this G beta, you, you, you need to use this uh, concavity assumption on G beta. And now, okay, so you, once you get this, you just rewrite the equation um, for, for you, Q. Okay, you get this one and you send Q to infinity and use the stability argument to conclude that U star is a super solution. Okay, all right. Uh, the last step is just uh, what I said at the beginning. So you use comparison principle and use the definition of this quasi convex envelope. Okay, and you prove the theorem. All right, so uh, at the end, I'd like to um, give you some examples and show you what kind of equation satisfy those assumptions of F. So uh, one um, assumption, which is actually uh, the first assumption, first example I gave you. Uh, so it's a, a little bit more general. So it, it's um, curvature flow, but it could be anisotropic um, curvature flow. And also we have some coefficients. This is a first order term. This is the driving force term. Uh, and uh, we can also have some non-local, uh, sorry, local term. It's okay, you know, put here. And um, in this case, this G beta, let's check if this G beta satisfy F7, okay? So this G beta is nothing else but the operator itself because it's a geometric operator. So it's nothing else but itself. Okay, so uh, as you can see, um, this G beta is concave in Hessian. There's no R here because it's geometric only the Hessian X here, so it's concave. All right, so, so we basically actually recover the result by Cardalia get, but with a PDE based proof, okay. All right, uh, the next one is uh, uh, slightly different. Uh, we still have this, uh, you know, um, curvature term. We still have this driving force term, but now we also have this U term. So this is a term, uh, depending on you, on the unknown. All right, so um, so now you can check that the, if we write down this G beta, uh, in order to have this concavity of G beta in R and X, we need to assume this V um, to satisfy all of these assumptions. Okay, so basically it's a concave function. Then we can also get quasi convex the preserving property for this type of equation. Okay, so it's not geometric, okay? Because now all of the um, in, uh, levels, level sets are not independent to each other. They somehow have some interaction uh, through this um, term in U. Okay, so actually um, this is a non-local version of uh, a local problem um, using, used in crystal growth. You can see the paper about applications, okay? All right, uh, okay, so I said, uh, we also want to check what happens uh, for local problem, for the heat equation, for example, uh, we can actually uh, write down G beta. I mean, it's actually a very easy calculation. And you can see that the uh, well, heat equation on the G beta is, is like this. Okay, so minus trace of X, this is fine. This is concave in X. But the problem is that you have this term, this is a, beta over R. R, beta is close to one, okay? So it's not concave in R, actually it's convex in R. So that's why we cannot expect the you know, quasi-convexity uh, preserving property for heat equation. I mean, actually, uh, Ishige and Sadani has to count example. So, but we can also, you know, check this assumption in our way and we can see that why it happens, okay? So, it's really about you know this um, um, infinite Laplacian, I would say. Actually, you can decompose Laplace, Laplacian 
in the way in this way. So this is the first term is I would say uh, one Laplacian. This is actually a normalized one Laplacian. Or you can also call it you know it's like curvature term times the, the length of gradient u. But I'd like to call it one Laplacian, and uh, and also a uh, uh, infinite Laplacian part. Actually, this this that term comes from infinite Laplacian. So as long as this term is present, you basically cannot expect. Um, Convexity preserving, quasi convexity preserving property to hold. I mean, for example, um, you probably want to consider P Laplace equation. I mean, from my point of view, P Laplace equation is just a linear combination of one Laplace and infinite Laplace. So as long as infinite Laplace is here, you always have this um, convex term in R. Okay, so we cannot expect. Okay. All right. So uh, I'd like to conclude my um, talk. So I provide a, um, well, actually, uh, this is a sufficient condition um, to guarantee uh, the quasi-convexity uh, preserving property. Uh, now, proof is a little bit different from the um, previous results. We use PDE-based approach, and our result can be applied to a general class of non-local evolution equations. And also, we check the local problem. And we found that the, actually the internal Laplacian part is the main reason why we cannot get quasi convexity preserving. And of course, there are many more questions to ask. Um, for example, uh, what about sufficient necessary conditions? So, what is the best assumption for us to get quasi convexity preserving property? And then we still don't know. And also, you may wonder what happens if we do non monotone evolution equations. Well, in general, we don't know. But actually, uh, but it seems to us that if you just replace this plus sign of the, you know, the equation we talked about by minus sign, it still doesn't matter. Uh, it still can get quasi-convexity property, but the proof will be different. We cannot have comparison principle. So it's gonna be a, 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 a different paper, I would say. All right, okay, I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture. Are thank there you. any questions or comments? <clears throat> I have one question about uh, your example related to uh, remote related to crystal growth problem. Yeah, sure. Yeah, could you go back to yeah. this slide? Yes. Yeah, okay. I think I'm yeah. uh, no, uh, it. I think the in the in the application often VU is not VU terms, but uh, mod gradient U times VU. Is it possible to handle such kind of cases? Um, if your VU is by mod gradient U times V of U, is it possible to um, study? Yes, I think so. Uh, I don't see much difference if I multiply this term by gradient u, for example. Uh, I, uh -huh. I think it's okay. Uh, but I have, of course, I have to check if the comparison principle is fine. But I think it's okay. As long as the term we multiply is positive, then it should be yeah, fine. Yeah, you need monotonic. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's still monotonic okay. u. So it should be okay. Yeah, and thank you for pointing out this, uh, the correct uh, way to write an equation, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any questions? So maybe my second question, is it possible to say something about strict convexity? Oh, okay, so... Even your original pro problem, like uh, curvature, mean curvature flow with, uh area term your first equation is it yes. possible say the motion becomes uh, strictly convex for uh, example if you talk about curvature flow then it becomes strictly convex sure sure if it's initially convex um we haven't thought about this problem but uh -huh. um but it would be great to, to get such kind of result but I'm not sure if, yeah, I'm not sure if you can do this. Basically, um, um, instead of proving um, it's quasi-convex, you want to show that the um, the curvature has a has a positive lower bound, something like that. Mm -hmm. 
But for that, I don't think, I mean, at least the, the current solution will not work for that purpose. Mm -hmm. But I don't know how to, yeah, how to. Yeah, it, that. It, it might be related to strong maximal principle issue, maybe. I see. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah, maybe. But do we have such kind of a result for local problem? I mean, without this mm -hmm. area. Term. Uh -huh. I, I, I'm not sure okay. if we have, yeah, have any no, results. No, no, no. Viscosity, right. viscosity, okay. PDE, I think there is, there should yeah. be, but viscosity, yeah. uh, right. um, it's not yet available, I think. Okay. 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 I think the, I think, we, uh, are there any short questions? Yes, I have uh, a question. Uh, okay, Daniel, please. Um, so, I mean, as you presented this example with the linear heat equation. Yes. I, I really like the, your explanation why uh, the convexity cannot right. preserve. Yeah. So what about if you replace, but you have a lot of, of course, uh, equation which are rather quasi linear and right. are related to geometric problems. But yeah. how about if you look for the, um, the heat equation for the pillar plus operator? So will it be as well, uh, convexity will not be preserved, I expect, or only yeah. oh. one, or? For convexity preserving property, it's I think it's fine. But for quasi convexity preserving property, I mean, you see, you cannot compare up, you know, yeah. these two properties because for yeah. quasi convexity preserving property, the initial value is also just quasi convex. So basically, you cannot say one is stronger than the other. Mm -hmm. So um, for quasi convexity preserving property or, or pillar plotion, I'm afraid it still it doesn't hold. I explained as long as basically to me it's just like a linear combination of one Laplacian and the infinite Laplacian. One Laplacian is basically just the curvature flow, so it's just geometric flow, so it's okay. Yeah. But the infinite Laplacian is really the term that caused the problem. But P Laplacian is like the in the middle, you know, so it's uh, it's not one plus one, it's going to be alpha plus beta, basically alpha one Laplacian plus beta infinite Laplacian, so it's mm. something in the middle. But as long as you have this uh, infinite Laplacian term, um, then this term, you, you know, this one over R term will eventually pop out. And this is really the enemy. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. You know. <laughs> a very nice uh, explanation. Yeah. I mean. yeah. Very sure, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture and also discussion. Thank you very much. And I think, I think it's time to stop. And uh, Daniel, there is a coffee time. Yes, there's a coffee break. And every one of the uh, registered attendees received actually already the link. Huh. So when you, uh -huh. there was an automatic generated email sent to you for reminding you to the seminar. And when you go in this email at the very bottom, we put already the link to the coffee break in. Okay, so we'll, we'll meet uh, Professor Liu in a coffee break. Okay. Okay. So okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye. See you there. See you Bye. Later. See you.